frequently asked, uh, and Caitlin's going to advance the screens, I think, but um, so that tells you all about this. Um, we're frequently asked how old the car market actually is, how, how, how long it's been going. Um, just for amusement's purpose, I show you a poster there of, of an auction of 1902 when they were selling old cars. So it's, it's pretty safe to say that things aren't, uh, aren't that modern. But the reality is, if we go to the next slides, um, that people started collecting cars <coughs> as early as 1912. Um, we know that they were actually thinking that old cars were probably part of the, uh, something that was going to be part of people's history. And instead of um, scrapping them as they were already doing, it seemed to be a good idea to look after them. And in London on Oxford Street, they actually opened something called the Motor Museum. And they tried to give you, even then when the industry was only 25 years old, they tried to give you a feel for what had been going on. Um, but you really have to jump forward about 50 years into the early 60s before you get to the market that we're actually, that we deal with today and the sort of origins of it. And um, the, the first major public auction of cars uh, was, took place actually in two stages, in, two, in 1963 and 1965. Uh, it was a collection in Scotland, in the UK, and it was a gentleman named John Sword who had amassed a very serious high quality collection. And it's the first time that we see Americans, um, Europeans, and the British all descending on Scotland to buy high quality cars. The reaction to that was that Sotheby's uh, decided to have their first car auction in 1965. Um, it took place on the 5th of November in London. And we think, frankly, that it, it basically it has marched on from then. From then onwards, uh, as soon as people were giving it um, serious uh, interest and the, the reality uh, when we saw collections such as the Harrah collection being built, um, the Harrah casinos, uh, Bill Harrah uh, in Reno building, um, his and Vegas building his collection, um, we started to see people taking it very seriously. Um, if we move on to the next slide, Caitlin, this is what it looks like now. Um, slightly different from the 1902 poster and certainly slightly different from things um, that you would see in the 1960s as well. It's uh, up until um, about three months ago, you would have seen a car auction looking exactly like this with all those people huddled together uh, in the old fashioned way, at least two feet apart, or maybe even one foot apart from each other. Um, the cars are presented, uh, the, the backdrop that you can see a car is driven by, the auctioneer, myself or one of my colleagues over to the right, a whole bank of telephone bidders, online bids coming in, a very modern way uh, in, in which things operate. Um, but what, the question is really what's, uh, what has changed between the 1960s and uh, the two, 2020, basically, um, and really since the 2000s. If we go on to the next slide, Caitlin, I think the really, the, in the 21st century, what we've actually seen is the cars have become an asset class. Um, people, up until that point, people considered cars to be, uh, they, they were a collector thing, uh, they were hobbyists, uh, people didn't really, uh, they, they didn't find the market to be very accessible, uh, it was something that a few people knew about. They held the information very close to themselves, um, usually because they're collectors and they wanted to get the best stuff for themselves. So the last thing they wanted uh, to share with other people was the fact that five doors down, there was a very special uh, Ferrari or Bugatti or something um, sitting in someone's garage because they were hoping over the years that someday they'd be able to acquire it. So they, they kept a lot of the information to themselves. They also kept the information about what was good and what was bad. Um, and it's only from those moments in the 1960s and what we've seen is the progression to today where people have started to chart the market in a completely different way. Um, and the market, because of that, because of the barriers falling away and the, uh, the knowledge becoming greater, the market has grown exponentially. If we go on to the next slide, Caitlin, one of the uh, there are now numerous publications that you'll see that are, are charting and online um, ch systems charting the values of cars. What are, what are things worth? How, you know, what, what's going on in the market? And the, the sort of pioneering one of those, which is still the, the biggest one really, and the one which is the m more major barometer, is something called sports car market. Um, sports car market, it talks about basically 
the serious cars, the more collectible cars, it gives you some background on all of the auctions and perhaps <laughs> private sales that have happened in recent times. It only deals with results that it can, that are tangible. Instead of saying, you know, we heard that something sold for this, or maybe once upon a time something sold for that. This, these are data points. Um, the magazine has been going, I think, about 30 years now, and it has become, you know, absolutely indispensable um, part of, of our market. And it is actually backed up very helpfully with a website where if you're a certain grade of member, you can actually trace the, the prices and the evolution of the prices of almost any model of collectible car. That makes it very accessible. Instead of it just being this sort of handful of people knowing things, anyone can do that. Um, and so you have, you have sports car market. Caitlin, if we advance, uh, there you go. You see that that's a, a sort of grid for a particular car, Mercedes 300 SL, I like a Gullwing or the Roadster that followed it. Um, there you go. You've got the progression of the prices. You've got the individual sales. And, and gives, it, it gives you a lot of data to work from. Um, if we go on further, um, that's, that'll give you, it even tells you the, the top sellers of the years. You'll see uh, back in 14, uh, big Ferrari sold by us and a few other things. Um, that, that's, that's what you can get to very easily. Another system that there is, is also if you advance again, um, we have the Historic Automobile Group International. Um, for the last 12 years, they've actually been uh, making a barometer of the market. They, they classified a certain number of cars as collectible. They put a line in the sand and they've worked out whether things are growing or whether they're shrinking and they're monitoring the market. There's another system in Switzerland also that is, uh, was run by a former auction person um, called, and it's called the K500 and he does the same. These, these sort of things, give people a very good idea of whether things are up, they're down, they're level. Um, and they give you also, they just give you proper comparisons. And that, that has really um, made a difference to how uh, the market is actually perceived. There's a lot more trust effectively. By having more information, the trust that people place in the market and the accessibility becomes greater. If we advance the slide then. So the, the categories of uh, what influences value, um, the rarity, I'm gonna walk you through these, but there are, there are four basically. The rarity of the actual production, whether they made a handful of them, whether they made a lot of them, um, the provenance, you know, uh, how good a car was, uh, whether it was raced, uh, whether it won important races, whether it was owned by a celebrity can be, it can be uh, an influence um, if it's somebody who was well associated with cars. After that, the condition is very, very important. Um, the, the condition goes from lots of scales. The condition is aesthetic condition, i.e. whether it's in very good, freshly restored condition, right through to the fact whether it is actually intrinsically a good car, i.e. whether it had a, a, a very pure life um, and was never altered, and it's, uh, it, it's literally very similar to the day that it was delivered, or whether it's had a very complicated life, um, and that can challenge things. Whether the engine that the car was born with still exists in the car is a frequent concern to buyers of Ferraris, of Porsches, of Mercedes, of Bugattis. It makes a big difference. And then one of the things that is really driving the whole market is actually what you can do with the car itself. It's more than just owning it. And I'll walk you through these. So we go to the next slide here. And we're going to flick through these. Rarity. So, uh, Caitlin, I'm going to show in quick succession, I think there are five slides of these, uh, of these Jaguars. So Jaguar, XKE, one. Number two. Number three. Number four and number five. Oh, we go back to number four. Sorry. Okay. So what's the what's the difference there? Go to go to the fifth one. It'll it'll amaze you. But the four cars that I've shown you there, the spread of value, they they look very very similar, don't they? But the spread of value there is from about eighty thousand dollars up to about eight million dollars. It's a huge spread, and so the rarity aspect that I talk about. 
you'll see a little arrow pointing at something on the side of this Jaguar. That is a early production Jaguar XKE. They made them with outside catches that you could open the hood on, believe it or not. It's nerdy stuff, but that's what they did. That's how they made it. And after a while, they decided that wasn't a very good system and they changed it. But what do collectors want? Collectors want the first one that they had. Go on to the next slide. You see the open, what we would call an open headlights. The car before you would have seen as the, has a covers over the headlights. The covers over the headlights meant that the headlights weren't actually very good. They didn't really do their job. Well, what does Jaguar decide to do? They opened the headlights, they made them bigger, but in doing so, they changed the design. Fantastic for drivability, very good if you're going around a road and a deer jumps out in front of you, you've got a better chance of seeing it. In terms of being a collector car, they don't like the later ones. They like the purity of the earlier cars. We go on to the next, next slide, Caitlin. The car that I showed you there with the two stripes, that is your $8 million Jaguar competition version. There are only 12 of those. Uh, we've had the pleasure of selling two of them in the last uh, five years. Only 12 cars. These look just like the other ones, but they were, they were built very specifically for races. They won a lot of races. And if they're particularly good, like this one was that we offered, they have very, very significant value. They're held in a, a completely different esteem from a production car. And the final slide, I think that we'll show you there, that again, looks very, very, very similar, but it's actually just plain a copy of what I just showed you. And the value of that is probably 175,000 on a good day, big delta of value. Um, so rarity makes a big difference. If we go forward to the next slide, here, provenance. Another staying with Jaguars, a very pretty Jaguar. The big difference with this one, uh, I think if we go through to the next slide, you'll see just down at the bottom of this page, it was Diana Ross's. She took delivery of this brand new. Uh, and for that reason, when we brought that car to auction, it made a premium. Um, it doesn't always, but it, it certainly can do. And in this case, there was a very nice photo of uh, Diana Ross and some of her family with the car back in the day, taking delivery of this car. And that is, that is, that, that bit of provenance could add to the car. More often, it's not necessarily about the owners of the car as to what the car actually did. If we go on to the next slide, the usability. So you'll see uh, in the top corner and the bottom here, you've got photos of uh, race meetings that happen at Goodwood in the UK. Uh, there are similar meetings in Monterey at the Laguna Seca. Um, there are hill climbs, there are all sorts of things that people can do that they actually use cars for in terms of racing. And uh, people genuinely will buy these cars to go and race. At immaterial of value. You know, people are racing cars that are $100,000 cars, people are racing cars that are 20 or $30 million cars. That, that is happening. Um, usability for events is, is as broad a spread as very serious competition as it is to what we call cars and coffee, where people literally turn up in a park, park their car, have a cup of coffee with their friends, and then go for a drive. Next slide, please. And then you have rallies and tours. Most of these are associated around a very famous Italian event called the Milla Miglia, uh, which they ran from the, uh, the mid 1920s through to the 1950s. They drove a thousand miles in three days around Italy. Uh, it's a combination of endurance and um, stamina and just making, uh, you know, it's, it, the photos and the, the, the period in which it was run is something that is very evocative to collectors. And if you, um, and because of that, there is, they run a, an actual re-version, uh, a historic Mille Miglia in Italy, but also a lot of the car rallies around the whole world that people actually want to do are basically copying the Mille Miglia in concept. There is a rally, there's a New England 1,000 miles. There is a Colorado Grand uh, that runs around Colorado, of course. And there are, there are many others of these formats, which usually are something like uh, between 50 and 80 cars uh, over the course of five days. Um, some sort of competitive angle, but really a good way to gather, use your car, 
um, have a nice few meals. And by the end of it, if there, let's say that there are something between 100 and 150 people actually on the event with 50 to 60 cars, maybe by the end of it, you pretty much know all those people. You've had a nice event, it's been sociable, you've driven through very nice scenery, um, and people really love doing that. They also particularly love doing it because they can either do it with, some, with a work colleague, they can do it with their partner. They, it, it's a very sociable aspect for them, and they look forward through the whole year to doing that. There is another component also, and if we click forwards then, there's concours and shows, um, and the next slide as well. Uh, we have people genuinely like also taking a car, restoring it, and presenting it against other cars, competing at a concourse, displaying them, um, and ultimately trying to win a prize for condition, history, or, or a combination of the, of the few of those things. And again, these, these are very popular events. Um, they are very accessible. A lot of people can attend them. Um, the Pebble Beach Concourse that will happen in, uh, normally in August, but won't this year, you can see something like 100,000 people will actually be on the field looking at the cars that are displayed. The pride, the, the winning at Pebble Beach, the, oh, there, is a, there are winners of classes and there is a winner of the whole, um, the whole event. Winning at Pebble Beach, the whole event, is, is about as high as you can get in that, in that whole um, genre of, of owning your cars. Um, it usually means that you've got A, a very special car, B, you've spent a fortune restoring it, um, and C, you've done it better than the other people on the field on that day. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, when you step onto that field on Sunday morning in August at about five o'clock, you could cut the atmosphere with, with a knife. It's, uh, it's pretty intense. Um, you may well have been able to run Microsoft. Um, you might be uh, the owner of a, a large set of uh, high street stores, but uh, you still have to have had the best car be in the best condition and appeal to the judges the most to actually win on that day. And they like the challenge and they, they rise to it. So that's, that's another component of, uh, of our business. If we go forwards from there, what is the spread of value? Um, we can, I'll show you the next slides. Next two slides are of a, the Ferrari that I uh, talked about earlier there. That's a Ferrari 250 GTO. Usually those are considered basically the top of the tree. Um, that particular car we sold for $38 million in 2014. Um, there have since that our value publicly has been eclipsed uh, actually twice, once publicly at about 44 million for a, a slightly later version of it. And secondly, um, a private sale of a car to the gentleman who uh, owns the WeatherTech uh, company. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, all sorts of things that you can get from car mats to um, dog bowls for your car to uh, whatever it is, what you should be greatly reassured that in buying things like that, you're ensuring that the owner of that company can have nice cars like this. And um, we quite like the fact that if you're making your money out of cars, that you should plow it back in. So uh, he has one of those and uh, 33 other people have one of those as well. And uh, they're a, they, there are enough of them. Um, so you do see transactions maybe once every two to three years of these cars. They're very, very special. They want, why are they worth so much money? they tick all of the boxes that we were just talking about. They're low in production, They're, they have rarity. Back in the day when you could use them, they won all sorts of manner of races, um, whether it be from uh, circuit racing to hill climbs to, uh, to the major events of those days. And that also then, because all of the hobby and the industry basically that we, we, uh, we have today um, mirrors what you could do back in the day, it means that you're eligible for doing um, for doing so many of those events. You could go you could go racing with one of these and probably win. Um, you could certainly show them on a field and win. Um, they also very nicely. The majority of the people of those 33 owners uh, all get together every five years and they go on a special drive themselves for a few days. And um, you know you'll. Uh, it seems amazing to think of it, but one of the flurries of activity in that market will usually be when we're about a year to 18 months out from the next one of those because somebody just 
has to be on that tour and that will motivate them to step up and buy buy one and become part of that crowd um, you will find one of those in the garage of uh, Ralph Lauren you will find one in the garage of uh, Lawrence Stroll uh, the Tommy Hilfiger uh, uh, impresario there and um, many you, 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 there are, there are, and um, the WeatherTech guy, uh, just to name a few of them. Uh, we move forward. There it is. That's that's the car. Um, the uh, notching down. This is um, this is some. I show this literally, sort of more as Bonham's bragging than anything. Um, another major value, ma major important car. Why is this worth a lot? It was driven by. Juan Manuel Fangio. Fangio is basically one of the greatest racing drivers of all time. Uh, still coveted anything that he had owned. Mercedes only built uh, a handful of these cars, and this is the only one that actually isn't sitting with Mercedes, uh, which makes a big difference. So when this came to auction, um, it made it made about twenty million pounds, which in the day was about thirty million dollars. It's a very very special car. Again, behind underpinning all of that, as with Ferrari. Mercedes Benz, a few of the more major brands here, really what you see in the modern market, what you see, the, the quality, uh, the luxury aspect, and the names, the names are still there. Those are important. And people, the, the broadness and the international appeal of the brand today means that the audience for buying these collector cards is also quite broad. Uh, we'll go forwards from here. So protecting the asset. Um, this is another important key to the market these days. Um, you know, in the old days, the, as I said, the information was held by very few people. Today, there are lots of ways of actually protecting your asset. You own your Ferrari, um, but how do you make sure that it is correct? How do you make sure that you've got everything, um, that it is exactly as it should be? Well, there are a few ways of doing this. Right now, we'll find that most of those brands, the manufacturers, have jumped into their heritage and they're supporting all of the old cars. Um, companies such as Ferrari, such as Mercedes, um, will have made certification programs. So they will rubber stamp, um, they will assess your Ferrari or your Mercedes or whatever it is, they will rubber stamp it and say, this is exactly how we built this car. And that, that gives you, um, that gives you uh, a great security in what you might own as a collector car. Um, there are other ways you can also do that and where there is maybe the brand doesn't exist anymore or the brand is so far removed from what it was originally. There are mark experts who will write reports who keep, um, for, for want of better expression, they're sort of train spotters for cars and they keep you know, all of the data and they will tell you, you um, in, the, uh, in the strange circles in which I habituate, you'll, you'll, you only have to mention a, a serial number and someone will say, well, that's the this, that did this, that went there, that blah, 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 blah. So there's, there, are, there are mark experts for most of the major brands. And those, and the, uh, a bit like a catalog raisonné, you know, there's those people that wrote the catalog raisonné for the arts, um, the artists. You know, if you have the genuine, sincere opinion today of these particular people, um, that provides you with security of, to protect the asset of the car. Uh, if we go on, okay, Lynn, so there you go. There's the, there's the, you see what we talk about is the little red book. So your little red book that Ferrari put to put together there, there's a little slide. It'll have your chassis number on it. It will tell you that your car is exactly what it should be. Um, Ferrari is also uh, incredibly clever with all of this. And um, if it turns out that your Ferrari is not quite as good as it once was, uh, they will make it right for you uh, for a small amount of money or even a large amount of money. Um, time heals everything. And Ferrari will actually say, well, we're terribly sorry, but your exhaust is not right. And the, the left turn signal on this car is not right. And uh, we don't think the body shape is quite right. So, but we'll sort that out for you. And then you'll be able to get your prized red book. Um, it's big business. Uh, Ferrari pioneered it. They started doing it in 2004. And when everybody, all the other major manufacturers saw them doing this, they thought, hang on a minute, there's, there's a market here. And they, they have tended to pile in. So if we advance the slides again, I think there's a few examples. Um, that's, a, that's an independent report by an Italian uh, Swiss gentleman who, as you can see, it's, uh, it's probably, probably in quite small print there for you to see it, but he gives the whole history of the car. He knows exactly what, how that car was built 
um, the history when it's been advertised, every magazine it's been advertised in. Um, there's not a lot that you can hide about these things. Um, so those Ferraris are, the, the more value, the more information there is generally. If we advance the slide as well, you'll see um, the top left is uh, a Mercedes data card that'll tell you exactly how your Mercedes was built. Porsche will write you a nice certificate of authenticity telling you how, the, how their cars left the factory. Um, again, if you go to the, uh, the concept of a, an engine having to be exactly the same as it was, the, the exact uh, engine that started life in the car, if you go to Porsche and they produce you your certificate and it's not the number that you've got in your car, then you know you're, you, you, it's not the original car or it's not one aspect of it, one important point isn't original. And um, that, it, that makes a difference. So pe people want to see these documents. Um, and, uh, and even Lotus, there you go, Lotus Certificate of Provenance, well, um, on the left-hand side there as well. Um, next slide. The trends, what do, what do we see um, in, the, in the industry and what have we seen? Uh, the more people coming into the market in the last 25 years uh, meant that there was less supply than the actual demand. Logically, that pushed the prices dramatically upwards. Um, the spread of the, the, the value move, the, the way in which the values have moved, um, certainly up until about two years ago, where they had never, ever been at a higher level. Um, you know, when we were talking about GTOs at 40, 50 million uh, and more. Um, as the values go up, people have become much more discerning. The, the frivolous activity of a few hobbyists who didn't really care if things were right or not has gone out of the window. Once there's major money involved, people think very, very carefully about what they're buying. And perhaps not surprisingly, they want the best of the best. And the best of the best is, is moving at a completely different pace to compromised cars. Uh, in when I first started doing this uh, in the 90s, you could you could present a car that was it was good, but it it had some issues, and you would say you would go for a value. Usually, you could price them at something like 65 to 75 percent of a good one. Uh, in the market today, if you have a bad one, you it's 50 percent. It could be 20 percent of the price of a great one. That's a big. Um, that's a big thing. The other thing that we've seen is the development of a modern classic market, which I'll walk you through here as well. What do I mean by a modern classic market? we we'll advance the slides, Caitlin. So things like um, Ferrari 288 GTO. Uh, in the 90s, we would sell one of those for about a tenth of what we would sell one of those today. Uh, next slide. Uh, Bugatti, the revival of the Bugatti brand that came in the 90s. Again, those cars languished. Um, they couldn't really sell them back in the day. Uh, they didn't build very many of them, but now they're, they're hot cakes and they're, they're going out the doors for big money. Um, 600,000, we sold that one for in the last couple of years. Another, other cars, Caitlin, next slide. Uh, things like a quirky car like this, a hot Mercedes-Benz E190 Evolution 2. Um, even those, you know, uh, what we would call, I think you call those sleeper cars in America where they, they sort of look like uh, a pedestrian sedan, but the reality is that they were the absolute hot version of them and people are collecting those. There is a tendency for people to collect things that they wanted when they were say teenagers or in their 20s and they were just starting off in life these are the sort of pin-up cars that they might have had that's what they wanted well when they when they start to do better in life when they've got a few spare uh, spare dollars here and there uh, not surprisingly they uh, they scratch that itch and they go out and they buy these um, and you do see you do see a certain tendency um, leaning towards uh, more modern cars um, picking up in value because of that Another example, Caitlin, can we go forwards? Um, what else have we got there? Yeah, this, this is when we're starting to talk seriously modern. Um, this was, uh, we offered this, this is a LaFerrari. We offered this for, uh, for sale in 2016 um, when it was literally, I think it was literally two years old and we were selling, we sold it for roughly 
three times uh, the price that the that Ferrari had sold it out of their doors. And this has been a, a, a quite a tendency as well. We've seen this also with the next slide, you'll see a McLaren um, that we have, McLaren P1, uh, the successor to, in the 1990s, McLaren made something called an F1, a uh, very, um, very well-known car now, uh, in that they built roughly 100 cars. Uh, they had a center sphere, which um, meant that you were sitting in the center of the car and you had a seat either side of you. It was designed by designer Gordon Murray, um, hugely prized for, uh, it was designed by McLaren to, it was their first road car for a very long time. It was designed to be the perfect car in every fashion. Um, and while they did struggle to sell them in the 90s and in the recession of the 90s, uh, that actually meant that production was curtailed and ever since, while they sort of bottomed out in price by about 1998 at about $400,000, $450,000, it was possible to buy a McLaren. Um, today, that's uh, an F1 would set you back about 16 or $17 million. Um, and McLaren, not surprisingly, with the demand that they had seen, the sort of latter day demand that they'd seen for the F1, decided that they would follow it up with a similar product and a series of similar products, frankly. Um, this, is, this is called the P1. Um, those, those were moving fast. They've cooled a little bit, but uh, as you can see there, you were, we were still able to get $2 million for those, which was vastly over list um, very quickly. And again, in the, in the collector car market, to sell cars that were two or three years old um, in, the two th in the early 2000s, they just didn't happen publicly. People weren't selling those cars um, in those days, but now you do. The modern collectible market um, is, uh, is a strong part of our business. And next slide, Caden. Um, I was asked uh, going into this, what, what about car funds? Are there car funds and what, what do we know about them? Um, well, today, as far as we're aware, there are a handful of funds um, we're not really sure that any have completed the full term of the fund, to, uh, nor have they then published the results of which to actually show whether it was a success. On paper, in theory, uh, if you had bought a certain cars through the 90s, early 2000s, um, even if you were buying cars in 2010 and selling them in 2014, 15 or 16, on paper, you would look like an absolute genius. Um, you, you were very few things that you could have done as smartly with your money. Um, and obviously people think, well, this is, this is easy. We should, get, we should get some funds together. We'll get a whole load of money and we'll pile in and we'll, we'll load up a whole bunch of cars. This, this, will, this will be absolutely perfect. The reality is that it's, it's less, it's not a, not a sort of tangible way of doing things. And that is because what we have found is that the people don't people actually want to own the cars themselves they where people were talking about setting up a fund and saying that they would have 20 of these cars people would say well yeah but if the fund at the end of the fund do i get that car and do i get that car or do i get that car or is that car my car or which car is my car because i'm not really interested in that car and it turns out that the car ownership is quite a personal thing um it added to which it um the paper aspect of you buying a car for, say, a million dollars and selling it, selling it for two million dollars 10 years later seems absolutely fantastic. If you take interest out of the money, uh, if you take the fact you've had to store it, if, the, if you take the fact that you went on the Mille Amelia, you blew the engine up comprehensively, it sat for three years with a restorer while they rebuilt the engine, had to recast an engine block, and the ultimate bill was a quarter of a million dollars to put it back on the road suddenly it's not it's not quite as pretty and these these are not um they, these are depreciate what the uk term for them is depreciating assets they, they are deemed to actually um over time they depreciate in condition and therefore in value um it's not actually true of course to a degree but um the the the, the delta between your one and two million might actually get sucked up quite quickly and when you talk about a fund most, most funds want an annual return at a very fixed rate. And the reality is that the, you don't get that same compound interest return. 
There is uh, currently, there is um, just launched in the last few years, a company called uh, Rally Road, which is sort of pioneering a concept where you actually buy, buy, your, buy a share of a car. Um, you know, they, they have a certain number of cars and you can buy a share of that. Again, we're not really sure of the buy-in um, and how well that is proving. Um, we, the, the people that are doing it are, are nice people. We know them relatively well. Um, they're, they're working hard at it, but I, I'm not sure that they have traction yet. Um, and as I say, just finishing up that slide there, we, we, there if, if, if it was a fantastically successful situation for these funds, we feel most likely that they would be banging a drum and telling us how wonderful they were and how successful it was. And we're not seeing a lot of that data published. Whereas we are able, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, through the other data that we have, we are able to see how individuals have done well with their cars over time. Uh, next slide. Um, what, what can I do? But uh, with Amy and myself on the call, I mean, how, how, else can we, uh, how else can we do anything but actually tell you what we do? Um, we actually, we help a lot of people. We, we are in the car world probably more than um, almost any other collectible. I think we're very much part of the underlying hobby of it. We guide people when they buy things. We guide people when they sell them. Um, we provide valuations. We frequently um, are just hopping around finding information about cars and then sending a note over to the guy who owns them and saying you know did you realize that your car did this or have you ever seen this photo of your car um we we help people sometimes we'll get calls um a guy you know something broke off their car How, you know any ideas of where i might find that um at bonhams um with our with our um with our uh, wrench in our hand and our um, t-shirt and flat cap, we're out there trying to find some things to help you uh, make sure that your car's still on the road. Um, collection management. We even actually talk, talk through with our clients and say, well, you know, is this really, as, as some people will start in the collecting hobby, they'll buy 40 or 50 cars, and then it takes them a little while to work out which of the genres that I just explained to you, they actually want to um, have part of. You know, do they want to be concourse guys? Some people realize quite quickly that that isn't so much fun. Some people say, well, I want to go racing, actually. As it turned out, I really like racing. Racing is what I do. Um, or I want to be on the, you know, I, the, there, there are just lots of different things that people, or I want to be on road tours. I want to do the Millimilia. I've got all these cars. I've got 50 cars, but none of them do the Millimilia. I didn't realize that none of them can do the Millimilia. How can you help me? And in those sort of situations, we'll be guiding them to say, well, look, really, you know, you'll need to spend about this much to buy a million million car. What you should really do is you should sell these three things, which you never, ever use now, uh, and, and upgrade them into your million million car. So the, these are some of the services that, uh, that we do. Uh, next slide. There you go. Um, Q&A. Q I think uh, I've probably given you a there's a lot of talking on my behalf that have probably given you a good, good overview of what we do, but I'm very happy to answer questions about uh, the, the, the industry in which we are. That's great, Rupert. Um, I think we'll hold questions until the end and uh, proceed with Catherine's presentation. I just wanted to give uh, Catherine Bastic uh, the introduction that she deserves. Uh, Catherine is a senior global luxury real estate advisor with Landvest and um, she will be speaking today on uh, broadly on luxury real estate in the uh, COVID-19 world. Catherine, take it away. Thank you, Amy. And uh, thank you, Rupert. That was very, very exciting and a tough act to follow. And we have a lot of very similar things that we, our clients look for. So it's going to be exciting. Um, and I hope I have um, equally eye candy in real estate as you had with the cars. So um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, I'm Catherine Bassett. I am the Senior Global Real Estate Advisor. I'm at Landbest and uh, I'm out of Boston and I live in Weston, but I have global experience in California, I lived in San Francisco and Los Angeles. <clears throat> and Amy and I started this um, this talk and originally we were going to have it in person at a club and um so but because of corona we're doing it like this and it's meant to be a cocktail hour and you're meant to have your cocktails in hand and uh very interactive so um 
not absolutely not a one of these where we're just talking to you so um, and then the chat feature is on so please know that uh, you know if you have a quick question we can certainly um, answer that but afterwards it would be nice if we all can exchange dialogue so Caitlin may I <laughs> so it's tough with luxury real estate investments. Um, there's so many aspects of real estate investments um, in the luxury world. Each one of the topics could take a session on itself. Uh, but for our purposes, we're going to be working with uh, purely uh, first or second homes and um, one that you're using yourself. Uh, last year, at the end of last year, everyone, or the beginning of 2019, there was a lot of talk about interest rates increasing and that uh, we were gonna be going into a recession. Um, and so <clears throat> this, I'm going into my 18th year in real estate. And one of the things that I can tell you without a doubt is every single election year, uh, the market just pretty much stops right about now until the election. And then after the election, no matter who wins or who loses, uh, the market just goes back up. It just feels like it needed a break. This year, however, with Corona, uh, we had our stop. Someone put a little button and boom, everything stopped. And so there was a lot of pent up demand from January, February, March, and even April. And then now we are uh, going really strong and um, we're expecting to get stay strong until December, probably till January. And, uh, and there's a huge pent up demand. We are seeing historic lows in our inventory. So <clears throat> with that, we will go to the next slide. So the, the problem with Corona for sellers is they don't want strangers coming into their home. Even though the real estate uh, industry has put in ma major measures with uh, gloves and uh, masks and everything, people still are very, very reluctant. And so therefore we have a huge pent up demand because the, the, the inventory is just not there. They're also afraid that the buyers aren't there. They're afraid that they might be selling at a lower level. And, um, and they're right. And sometimes um, I've spoken to uh, many top agents around the country, or around the world. And in the first week or so of this pandemic, people were walking away from $200,000, $300,000 of money because they just uh, were afraid of what was going on. And they left that money on the table and the property went back on the market and the property you know, then winds up selling. The other thing is if they wind up selling this property, where are they gonna move to? Will they be able to find a suitable replacement property for their family? Um, so next slide. So are we in a bubble? I'm here to tell you, I do not think we are in a bubble. Um, so with the early 2019 and the doom and gloom uh, noise, there have been 144 interest rate cuts globally in the past year. And so, and then today, a couple of hours ago, we got news that uh, interest rates will not be going up until 2022. And what, uh, <clears throat> So the difference between 2006 or the early 2000s and now is the following. In that market, people were buying homes because they wanted to flip them. They looked at it as an investment. They would buy four or five of them. They would buy it in the sand states, Arizona, Florida, um, Nevada. And then they would, uh, before they were even built, and then they would flip them. And this of course was a huge, a problem, a lot of um, people doing illegal things and with mortgages, and so that's what happened. But since then, we have Dodd-Frank, which has put a huge 
amount of uh, too many restrictions, in my opinion, on the banks for lending. And the banks are in very healthy condition. And the people who are buying houses now are buying it to live in. They're not buying it to flip. And then the historical correlation between recession and housing market, um, they are not correlated really at all. Only one time have they followed each other. And that was in that 2008. Um, and that was because it was caused by the real estate industry. But other than that, when we're in a recession, the, the housing market tends to be rather um, healthy. Uh, and um, well, I think we talked about the a potential appreciation in value. And then today, of course, buyers want to live in the homes that they are buying. Next. <clears throat> so what are buyers looking for? And everyone needs a home, but nobody needs an estate or a, a penthouse. Uh, I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal in December, and they wanted to know what the difference was in luxury. The article was about luxury in 2010 as opposed to 2020. And my uh, comment to them at the time before Corona was that I felt that uh, health, wealth, be, well-being, and uh, safety, they would be the paramount things that would make a home more desirable to uh, the wealthy, the high net worth individual, as we call them. And um, little did I know this was going on, but more so than ever, people would want homes that have uh, clean air. And now they're coming out with things that are uh, almost like a submarine. You walk into an entryway and then there's the violet lights and ultraviolet lights and it cleans everything up and then you can enter your home. So even in the beautiful uh, open space modern homes that we see, uh, people are looking to add that sort of element to it. They're looking for two types of uh, pantries, one for emergencies like this. They want to be able to know that they're not going to be in lockdown mode. So if they will, when they are in lockdown mode, they can continue to live and they can continue to be with their families. Uh, one of the sales that we saw earlier this year broke um, a record in the North Shore. And that was a family that had been in Martha's Vineyard and they were very scared that uh, they wouldn't be able to get off Martha's Vineyard and that perhaps they wouldn't be able to get hospital care should they get sick. So they wound up more, moving closer to the city in a big, beautiful compound, broke a lot of um, records on that one. And then they were able to invite their adult children into the home, and then they had a place for everybody. And that is what we are seeing a lot in this environment. Um, a lot of compound living. We're seeing a lot of people moving from New York City to central New Jersey or to the Hudson Valley. We're seeing a lot of migration from Boston to uh, Maine and Vermont and New Hampshire. And um, when I say migration, these people are not selling their Boston home or the New York City home. They're just making this other home, which maybe in the past might have been a little condo or something. They're making it a massive purchase. And that is a home where they can last for three, four months if that's what they need to do. So uh, we've had a huge inventory crash um, in the million and above market. Uh, we had 59% decrease in listings. So if you can imagine that, 59% decrease in um, listings. Um, however, the sales amount was just like 32% lower, uh, but the price per sale is 6% higher. So there's just uh, <clears throat> some other facts and figures, but I just thought that picture was lovely. So Caitlin. Um, and here's some of the other statistics for the um, a market analysis by the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. And um, this is for the greater Boston um, area. And then as you can see uh, year to date, uh, the new listings in this one, we're down 
19% for the month of April, we were down 53% and then for condos, 22% and then in April, 53%. But however, the median sales on, um, was a 6.9% and then 7.8%. <clears throat> so where are the buyers coming from and why are they buying? <clears throat> so Living vertically and being an urban dweller is very tough in this time, especially if you have uh, young kids. So uh, that has been a migration to the suburbs. We've seen huge amount of uptick in suburban sales. And um, so that again is a safety thing. The low interest rates are very, very appealing. Um, perhaps they're able to buy a home that they haven't. Uh, seen before. You know, on the flip side, we are seeing people who are uh, very anxious about their uh, income, like a doctor or a lawyer, and they haven't been able to practice. So, and they don't know when this might be done, like a plastic surgeon, not normal doctors. But anyway, so um, they, those people have stopped looking. And then um, they don't want to be in another lockdown. Um, and they're just stuck and they can't be with other people or just nature. They just want to be around um, a lot of, they just want to be able to move freedom. You know, I think we as a country, we like our freedom. And then um, the stock market has just been on a huge tear. And a lot of people are saying, hey, maybe I need to take some money off of that and then put it into real estate because real estate still is a very uh, good investment. And I believe we have a lot of room to grow there. Next. So um, I want to also just talk about uh, the, the, the city living part because it's something that's very, very important to us too. Uh, so the, the people who are buying these homes, they still have their homes in the city, as I said, but the city condos really need to, especially in the newer developments, they really need to step it up and they need to offer for a lot more security, uh, personal security for their uh, buyers. Uh, the St. Regis has done a great job of that. And I remember when I first went to their uh, showroom, and all these showrooms, by the way, they had to close down. They're doing everything virtually. And they have their uh, doorman, not the doorman, but the, um, it's the guy, uh, the concierge, He's over there on the side. So you don't have to go and talk to him every time. You're not dealing with people. The floors, there's just a very, uh, it's not the huge, humongous high rise. It's just 144 units. So you have the ability to be socially distanced and the elevators are not crowded. Um, we are, you know, elevator management is a huge issue. You know, how do you get several people at the time they're all coming home? So anyway, there are a lot of challenges in that, but um, we are all very smart people. And I think the real estate and the luxury market is just gonna be doing really great. And um, I wanted to just show all, any of you who wanted to buy a, one of those beautiful luxury cars, I would love to help you find a garage to put it in. So thank you. Great, Catherine. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I love this, the last slide where you integrated, I believe it was a Porsche, correct, Rupert? Porsche Pizza, 356 Pizza, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, uh, if, if uh, any of you haven't launched your cocktail as yet, please feel free to, to join in. Um, I'm having a um, Hartford Court Sonoma Rosé uh, made from Pinot Noir grapes uh, from 2019. It's delicious, refreshing. Nice. Um, we have a couple of questions on the chat that I wanted to go back and review. Uh, one was from Barbara, and um, she was asking, I think it was in relation to the McLaren. She was wondering if we would see an F1 McLaren. Is that is that right, Barbara? Is that your question? Yeah, I was just curious if you had a, a photo of the F1. Yeah, let me, I, I'm not a huge techno whiz, but I will, I will try and do that. Hang on. Okay, we'll come back to you. I think. Let's see. 
I think that was it in Zoom and in the Zoom chat. If anyone else has a question, please. I do have a question for Catherine. I was just curious as to, you know, in the, the suburb, going back to the suburban market, um, how, wow, that's beautiful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Enough about the suburban market. Yeah, I'm like, okay, it's so. <laughs> You could live in your car. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I have friends who this is the, the perfect car for. Um, Catherine, so back to the, um, thank you for sharing that. That was, it's a, it's a very beautiful car. Um, I wanted to see what the difference between the P, was it the P1? P1, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to see what the difference between the two are. Um, so, Catherine, in, in the suburban market, because as you know, I, I'm on site uh, in Boston, and just yes. seeing the difference of the suburban, um, the market right now compared to the city, because I know we're, we're seeing a little bit of the slowdown due to COVID, but then also as we were getting closer to ramping up and getting people on site, then the protesting started. And now- Right, you can't win. Market. Yeah, <laughs> we're not dealing with that in the suburbs. <laughs> no, we don't. But we did have a very peaceful march in Weston that I joined in on. <laughs> it was nothing like what was going on in Weston. I mean, in Boston, but yeah, it's really tough because also I have clients coming in from London who want to buy a place in Boston. And um, they're going to be shocked when we're driving around and everything is, you know, yeah, it's going to yeah. be like a third world country yeah. to see these, uh, you know, uh, boarded up beautiful shops and restaurants. So Yeah, it's kind of like a hurricane, right? When people, um, but you know, so it's interesting because in our Boston market, we typically rely on the demographic of the suburban demographics to sell their home and then they purchase in the city. Um, and we're not seeing that right now. I think we're seeing more people are rethinking and reevaluating and staying in the suburban market. So are they just, how, how do you, what do you see people coming in from the city that are moving to the suburbs or are they just buying larger homes in the suburbs? So with um, both. So I have seen where people have hunkered down and they bring in their adult children living in their home. Um, and, and they haven't really been anywhere like for two months or three months. And they have, uh, you know, groceries delivered to them and they have a very massive clean out plan and all of that. So we are seeing um, quite a bit of that. Also, we are so lucky that we do live in this area because we have so, you know, so much of the money that's going into COVID research or medicine is from this area. So um, we're, we have uh, people who want to do research and they'll buy a massive home so that they can do their research in the house. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm just in the process of selling that sort of a house today. And um, I want to just talk about one other thing. I recently got into contract with um, in a house in Wellesley. And when we first went in to do that property, it was, uh, we went in and we quoted one price that we thought it was worth. Then someone else, another very top agent, they came in and they quoted a higher price for them. And then another one even came in at a higher price. But they went with us because they thought we were, um, the most genuine and we know what we're doing and the people who are having to uh, advise their clients and this was a, a, a situation where uh, the parents had passed away and the kids were figuring out what to do with the parents estate and so we uh, we advised them on a couple of things to do they did what we asked them to do we went back to the house and then we decided that this was far greater property than we had originally thought. And we raised the price. And then on top of it, this has a big land. And then we said, hey, I wonder if this land is dividable. So then we have a whole consulting group at Landvest and we bought in our uh, consultant and said, what can you do with this? He came through all the stuff, talked to the attorneys, the city, everything, found out that there were two extra lots on that property that nobody knew about. So then we raised the price again. And then we, um, and you know, this is, this is what you have to do in this world. Like in this market, you have to show 
value. Like, yes, maybe this, this is worth a million, but in fact, if you dig a little bit deeper, it may be worth three, four million. So those are not the numbers that happened in reality, by the way. So um, anyway, we uh, put the house on the market and then we uh, were in contract in 10 days at asking price and a backup because we were able to show. And by the way, uh, one person couldn't care less about the subdivision possibilities, but they wanted to step up and the other person cared very much about the subdivision possibilities. So kind of keeps everybody honest. Anyway, um, I want to just underscore, this is Ruth, I just want to underscore what Catherine did here because it was really a distinguishing quality of the work and particularly in this group where all of us are working really closely with the high net worth market. The average real estate agent, in order to produce at a level that makes them a quote top performer, needs to have at least one closing a week if not three or four. At that level of production, you're really not able to devote a whole lot of attention to each individual listing. The model that Catherine and the Landvest team use is that maybe a Landvest agent will have 12 closings a year. So that's maybe one a month. And what that means is that you're able to devote an awful lot more care and attention to each individual client problem so you heard this example, right, where Landvest came in initially at a low value, then Catherine put an awful lot, she's being very polite, but put an awful lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making the house look a whole lot better than it ever looked, <laughs> and bringing a lot of style to the property, which is key because it helps an enormous amount. And then as she said, engaging, and that took it up to another price point, even or slightly more than where the other brokers were. And then engaging the consulting group to unearth the underlying land value in the property to take it to an even yet higher value. So a facile decision that might have easily been made by one of our clients to just take the offer from the local broker that was the highest price would have actually left a considerable amount of money on the table for the client. Yeah. <clears throat> and that additional amount of due diligence that's made possible because of the exclusive focus on the high end that the, that the team has allows them to uncover value and to protect the client's interests in a way that would not be possible in a conventional real estate business model. So I just want to underscore that because it's, it's important to this audience. It's just not something that the rest of the market would normally think about and it's important for you guys to understand. And I think as Bonhams, you guys would really appreciate that too because of the time and attention, Amy, I know that you and your team put into each object and the material. It's the same thing, that level. And we wound up getting over $500,000 for this client than what we were going to do. Anyway, thank you, Ruth. Anyway, anybody else? Ch ch chime in. Did I answer your question, Barbara? I hope. You did. So I was just curious, again, is just where you were seeing the people who were, you know, are they trading up? Are they just moving within the suburban market? Are they moving from the city looking to... They're buying houses in the country and on the water. Mm -hmm. They're definitely moving into the suburbs, but the big thing is second moves. We've broken so many records. It's crazy. We all on our on a call on Mondays, and yeah, it's like I, I'm always like, I want that house. I want to be on that water. So it's pretty awesome. That's so interesting. Uh, I wanted to just uh, ask if Rupert could speak a little bit about how uh, we've had to adapt our uh, auction model uh, to respond to the reality of not being able to hold live auctions at this moment in time and how you're planning for your uh, August sale in California. Yeah, certainly, Amy. Um, we, uh, obviously, w one of the things that um, was not, uh, not exactly clear from my presentation is that a lot of the car auctions are attached to events. We, when you, you, these days, if you go to these events, there is an, an auction at those. And all of these events have been canceled because of the, the volume of people that would attend them, the lack of sponsorship, and many of the sponsors immediately pulled their sponsorship. And so we, we had to change our model. Um, but what we, what we quickly realized was that uh, there was a lot of traction in the market anyway. We were seeing that people were still buying cars. Some people were buying cars blindly online. 
And so what we have done is actually we've, we've made a, a business model which incorporates all of, basically all of the aspects of, of a, a blind online auction with, um, with a, a, a sort of the, the standard auction that you might um, be used to. And so we will have sales um, for the cars. We've actually done this for, uh, we did it for a Native American art originally, um, a Los Angeles based sale where the expertise from Bonhams was uh, for Native American art was in, in Los Angeles. The property, the, the pieces that we were offering were uh, in our Los Angeles uh, sale room there. We previewed, you could, you could um, come and inspect the pieces if you wish to, um, but uh, by appointment only. And then we held an auction, which we did behind closed doors. There was no, uh, there was no opportunity for people to attend physically in Los Angeles, but we streamed an auction uh, with an auctioneer with telephone bids so that there was people could have active participation in it and supplemented as well with online bidders as, uh, in, into the mix as well. Uh, the most amazing thing, um, well, there are two amazing things really about it. The, the sell-through was uh, in the high 80s in percent sold. So the, the sell-through was incredibly good. Um, we found that uh, because the people were not actually um, perhaps as busy and distracted as once they were, um, the focus on this sale was much bigger than we had normally had for these sales. We had many, many more people participating in the sale. Um, but, but to add to all of that is that we actually ran the, the auction room, um, the sale room where the auctioneer was and where the telephone bidders and where all of the uh, nucleus of the operation happened was in Oxford in the UK. But it was streamed effectively out of Los Angeles. So it looked ostensibly on Los Angeles time, people were bidding uh, for Native American art. Um, but they were actually responding their bids to an auctioneer who was in the UK at that time. Um, and this business model we found to be extremely successful because it, it brings all the sort of the, the deadlines and the um, immediacy of focus on of the auction process uh, to people. Um, it adds a bit more excitement. Um, we've just done one for cars where you have uh, previews of the cars. We were literally walking around the cars, videoing them as we sold them. Um, so people would get a, a flavor of what they were they were buying. Um, and we we found that to be very successful. And in the states, we'll we'll do the the first one of those. We'll do on August the fourteenth, um, replacing our normal Pebble Beach auction. I'm going to miss Pebble Beach this year. I was I had my airplane ticket. I was so ready to go. It's crazy. Bummer. Well, next next year it's the seventieth anniversary, so it'll be next year. So you you will get to enjoy it. It'll, it'll be it'll be a big uh, it'll be a big event. A uh, question. If they don't have one, is it the 70th anniversary or that becomes 69th anniversary? <laughs> they will, they, this year would have been the 70th. So they, they, will, oh, they, will, okay. make, they will make oh. next year. And I think that's, that's one of the reasons they pushed it back is that they didn't want to have a, a lukewarm major mm -hmm. anniversary. So it'll be, it'll, okay. be a, it'll be a big bash for next year. Great. Would you like me to show uh, the video for the upcoming auction, Amy and Rupert? Sure. sure. It's very short. We don't want to hold anyone, to, you know, too much longer, but uh, it's, it's very short and kind of fun. It'll give you a flavor of um, the car, world of car collecting as well as uh, Rupert's uh, uh, auctioneering talents. So sure, please. We need a video. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. We really enjoyed it. I apologize for the uh, technical issues we had up front, um, but uh, we're so pleased and we hope that you've enjoyed the series. 
Uh, we're taking a little break and then we plan to come back with some uh, additional topics and we'll send out invitations and, and hope to catch up with all of you soon. So thank you very much. Thank Fantastic. you. Always fun. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Okay.